Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ, knowing that you are our teacher, that you will teach us all things because your word is true. I ask that you would filter out all of that which is foolish, but seal to our hearts only that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Uh, I guess we're going into winter, and so uh, uh, that's the reason for uh, me stopping uh, uh, shaving. So I hope that doesn't bother anybody. I, you know, most I, I think most people are used to seeing pastors, you know, uh, clean shaven. But it's not important at all to me uh, either way. So here we are. We're studying together verse by verse in the first epistle of John. And we're in chapter 2. And we're in the area of verses 28 and 29. We've been introduced to the spirit of uh, Antichrist, which says that Jesus Christ has not come in the flesh. That spirit of Antichrist has been around since the day John wrote this epistle. And it's, it's that spirit of Antichrist is still very uh, identifiable today. If he's not virgin born, Christianity means nothing, folks, and your entire concept of what Christianity is collapses. He's God Almighty incarnate. Therefore, he is able to redeem us. And so we've been looking at that spirit of Antichrist. Uh, Jesus Christ is God of very God, the one who spoke the worlds into existence, who, the one who gave the law on Mount Sinai, the one who died on the cross. That was our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus, God incarnate in human flesh. Therefore, we have a kinsman and we have a redeemer who's able to redeem us because he's not touched by sin and he lives in that part of us that's not touched by sin. The new man. We're going to see that in chapter 3. And we get down to the uh, fact here of verse 27 that we were anointed by, by the Holy Spirit. We've received that. We don't need any man to teach us because we're taught his word. God teaches us through his word, I believe, not through personal experiences and, and, and all of that. I believe that that expression, all truth is God's word. I believe that's God's responsibility. He promised that he would do that. And we can trust in, in, in him that he will do that. If God inspired the original writings, he can guard the translations. I don't think that there's, and I've said this before, I don't think there's a translation anywhere out there that's available to you that, that if you don't study it carefully, that if you study it carefully and you compare scripture with scripture, that, that uh, it'll lead you into all truth. You are not redeemed because you believe in Christ. You believe in him because you are his child. Uh, if, uh, if you're not, if you have any questions about that, you might want to, uh, if you haven't seen my, if you didn't see my last video, that, that might, may answer some questions concerning that. We don't believe in order to be redeemed. It's uh, those who believe, the only ones who, who believe the only ones who can hear the only ones who can believe are those who have been born again by God from above. That's what this book says. But of course we kind of reverse that today. Uh, actually it's a, it's always been a, there's, there's always been some around who've reversed that all the way going back right to the very beginning. There's always been those who reversed that order. And, uh, and that's what we're not looking at in the text. So Jesus Christ died in our place. That was a substitutionary death. And we need to keep this in mind as we approach the final words of this chapter. We're, we're getting ready to conclude chapter 2 here. Uh, and we're going to be looking at some verses that I've really wrangled over because these are not easy verses to just, you know, glance at. And out of context, if you just pull the verses, you know, 28 and 29 out of context, if you just read these verses uh, as standalone verses by themselves without the support of the, the surrounding context or 
or the overall uh, picture of the New Testament and what's true of us in Christ, if, if we just do that, then we're not going to, I believe, we're not going to arrive at the, at the right, the correct interpretation. We're not going to see what the Holy Spirit had in mind when he wrote these, these words. The, the thought that the Holy Spirit intended to convey will be lost if we don't follow certain rules of interpretation. So uh, here's the question is, will any Christian, will any one of God's children appear before him at his coming, uh, appear ashamed before him at his coming? That's the question. We're going to talk about that in this video. I hope that you uh, will uh, allow me some time to hover over this because I believe this, just given the nature of the verse, that there's a, it's, there appears at least on the surface, it seems that there's a possibility that we can be ashamed that it's coming. I think that's a big deal. And so I think we need to spend some time looking at this. And it's, I think it's important that we get this right. So I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, give you, you folks a few options to think about as we go forward here. Now our text says we have an anointing that abides in us. I believe that anointing is the Holy Spirit. Most of the commentators do as well. It's important that I go away and if I go away, I'll send another, our Lord said, just like myself. And so I believe that anointing is from Christ. It's the Holy Spirit. He remains in, in us. Now I may not see that on the outside. I mean, that's of course the, you know, the big, discussion today among many of the Bible teachers that I talk to if, if I don't see it in you then well it must not be true of you and and so you're not his child and I folks I can't make that step my Bible tells me that if Jesus Christ anointed you with the Holy Spirit that he remains in you you know you might grieve him you might quench him but he remains in you and you don't need any man to teach you because you have his word and what I believe it says is that you don't need other means or other methods or, or other tools as the source of truth. The, source is, uh, the, the only source of truth is this book. Now, many would argue that, but I'm going to stick with that, uh, as I always have. You need not that any man teach you, but the same anointing teaches you all things, and is truth, and is no lie, even as it has been taught ye shall abide in him that's a heavy statement okay ye shall abide in him and then we come to verse 28 and now little children abide in him but but wait a minute i mean he just said ye shall abide in him verse 27 okay uh that's a wonderful truth that he will absolutely remain in you and that you will absolutely remain in him. And folks, that is a very strong proof of eternal security, but this video is not about that. But I, I did want to point that out. So our abiding in him, uh, I believe, is our resting in that accepted fact is true. The Holy Spirit will remain in me and I am now presently commanded to remain in him. Uh, that is, continue to abide in him, that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be made to be ashamed before him at his coming. Passive voice, made to be ashamed. That's what it said. And so we have some options, okay? There's several approaches to this verse. I've, I've spent days really uh, wrangling through this. I think I've come up with a few possibilities. I'm gonna put these possibilities out there for you to think about. And then I'm going to tell you what I think it means. And uh, I'd like for you to consider the other possibilities just as much as you would consider what I think it means. Because uh, as everyone knows, uh, no one has a handle on the truth. And uh, I would rather uh, you, you folks study to show yourselves approved, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, not just go away saying, well, this is what Steve believes, so, and that sounds pretty good to me, so that's what I'm going to believe. Dearly beloved, I'm trying to get you, I'll drive you into to, to this book, okay, to examine these things to, be, to see if they, they be so. Uh, the Holy Spirit is our teacher. He will guide us into all truth. 
Now, if you're strongly uh, Arminian, uh, you know, the uh, man-centered, fleshly, uh, law-oriented, you know, if that's, if that's who you are, uh, you know, well, you've got a very puny God, uh, and you can take uh, the verse to say, well, this, what this means is you're going to lose your salvation. I mean, there you are, you're clear up to, to when he comes, and you find out that you never made it. You were there for a while, but you lost it. You, as a believer, born-again believer with the Holy Spirit, who said that he would remain in you and you would remain in him, well, somehow that got messed up. And so uh, that's, that means you lost your redemption. And that's, that, is, that is an approach that many, many, many Christians take on that verse. I'll tell you, that's, if you want to be in the majority, then that's where you want to go, okay? There's another option. Uh, you could take the position on that verse that when he comes, you're caught in some compromising situation, you know, that, like, uh, you know, when he comes, you're, you're caught with another man's wife or, or whatever, whatever you want to throw in there. You know, and that causes a lot of people great shock. Now, I, I think God is a God of grace. Uh, I mean, you see, in your mind, it would be much worse for some married man to be in bed with his mistress when Christ appeared than it would be for you to be caught cheating $10 on your income tax. So, you know, you make some sins worse than others. So there's that option. So there's a great number of Christians who take this as a moral lapse. You know, you want to be careful how you live morally so that you're not in a moral lapse when he comes because you'll be ashamed. You'll, you'll be ashamed. So they put a moral emphasis on the 28th verse. Uh, now, since this must be referring to the rapture, some, some would say, well, okay, you missed that. So he'll reject you. You didn't make the rapture. You know, he won't take you when he raptures the church. But if we compare scripture with scripture, I don't believe we can take that position, but, but people grab a verse, they build a whole thing on one verse alone, and we know that that is not true. We know that there is no such thing as a partial rapture of the body of Christ. If you study this book, you know that to be true. But they, that's what they say, okay? They, they say, okay, so he'll reject you. He won't take you when he raptures the church. That's another, that's another option. You could go down that road if you want to. I think that road goes nowhere. Uh, when Christ, our life, shall appear, then you all, that's plural, shall appear with him in glory. There's no condition placed on that. Now, that's either true or it's not. So, so there's that approach to the verse. Okay. So we lose our, redemp our redemption or we have uh, some moral lapse uh, or we miss the rapture and, and, and we don't have very many possibilities left. So I'll tell you what the verse means or, or, and I'll tell you what it means and, and, and you won't have to worry about any of this, these other views. It's, and I hope some of you laughed at that. I will tell you what I think it means and I'll let you decide. Okay, that's what I'll do. I suppose there's another possible approach to the verse that this expression is tied to your convictions. So this is a very popular one among all of those who are sort of lean the way that we do. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's not about losing your redemption. It's not about missing the rapture. It's not about a, being caught in a compromising situation really per se, but th it, there's this idea that your redemption, your redemption, uh, uh, it's, well, it's, this expression here, this of being ashamed, is tied to your convictions, okay? Uh, uh, now, I, th I think Scripture emphatically den denies such an idea as that we know from the life of the Apostle Paul, as well as others in Scripture, that that's just not the case, that our redemption hinges upon whether we believe correctly or believe at all. Uh, if you watched my last video, you'll understand that. You know, that you're redeemed by your believing anything, much less believing correctly. You know, for example, when Christ comes back, he finds you believing that there wasn't a rapture of the church, so you're ashamed before him at his appearing. You know, is it possible for someone to belong to God and yet believe he or she is saved by works? Well, of course it's possible. 
Not only is it possible, it's, the, it's actually the predominant position of most Christians today. And they'll, they'll adhere to that deeply held conviction until the day the Lord appears. You know, now if you say that that is not possible, then you're saying that redemption is based upon your faith or your works or both. Uh, I do not believe that we should think based upon the verses that I outlined in my last video, it's, which I believe is, is a very good video I think you all should watch, then we must believe so that we might be redeemed. And if that belief isn't there, we can't be redeemed. You know, folks, redemption is a work of God, by the will of God, not the will of the flesh. We were chosen in Christ, quickened to life, at His timing, by the way. And though that's true, we, we might... We may all hold us to some really strange convictions until he appears. Think about that, okay? Uh, we're, we're just Christians today are all over the place. We're, we're that we remain ignorant of much truth up until the day Christ returns. And we all have an, our own set of presuppositions, folks. We all have our own preset of uh, pre-designed, I don't know, set of, Uh, you know, we just, we built our own theology on what we think is true. Uh, I think people are going to be ashamed by what they say. All right. But I'm not sure that that's us. Okay. Matthew 12, our Lord said, by your words, you will be cho shown to be justified or by your words, you will be condemned. But now, now wait a minute. Paul in Romans 8, 1 says, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. I'm not so sure that this being ashamed is referring, is, has any relationship to believers, but I believe that it may very well have a relationship to those who are not his, such as those who went out from us because they were not of us, okay? That we just saw in the, in the, in the context of our present study. So we're gonna look a little deeper into this. So, you know, the $64,000 question here, here is, will we, those in Christ, will we, will some of us or all of us or, you know, any of us, will we be ashamed? Is it talking about us? Well, I, I, I'll admit I have some problems with that. If that were true, first of all, if that were true, then all of us would be ashamed to some extent. Okay, you could say, you know, we'll, we will... Uh, stand there having thought we were going to make it because we we watched because we worked because we're morally upright you know that's why we're going to make it just to realize that we were wrong and that we'll we'll be there uh because we we did everything right or we or uh we're i guess what i'm saying is that that i mean that's Look, that's the only reason that we're there is because Christ died in our place, okay? That's it. And why can't we take God at his word? God said, when he returns, I'll, I will appear with him in glory. That Steve Sewell will appear with him in glory. That's what the text says. Now, if I don't believe that, Will I be put to shame when he appears? That's, that's what I'm driving at here. Uh, there, there are many who don't believe that their sins are forgiven as we've been shown in the text here. But it doesn't matter how we feel. What matters is, did Christ die in our place? My little children, I write unto you because your sins have been forgiven. And I think shame is going to come upon someone here, but I'm not persuaded that that shame will come upon us. I'm not 100% persuaded of that. Uh, us, that is God's children, even if we trusted in works or, or we trusted in our pastor or we trusted in our family or our friends or our, our church. Folks, we need to keep in mind the God that we worship is a God of grace a God of all grace, a God of glory, a God of power. We aren't the only ones in the body of Christ. We're not the only ones who believe truth. We're not the only ones that are strong in our convictions. We are a diversely opinionated people, okay? 
who basically, for the most part, can't get along because of those opinionated differences, who have been redeemed, all of us have been redeemed because of Jesus Christ's death in our place, not because of anything we did. We are his children by grace. Will we be ashamed before him at his coming because we trusted in the flesh or in our false beliefs or you know, because we trusted in our church or our pastor or we trusted in the depth of our knowledge of the word or, or who knows what? Rather than setting our affection on Jesus Christ who died in our place and is seated at the right hand of God. I'll just tell you, I believe the verse says that uh, we are going to, and this is, you know, translations aside, King James, nobody speaks King James today, okay? And it's just another translation, just like the rest, the over 500 now, English translations alone. If you don't believe that, look at research it. There's a lot of translations out there. Uh, we have to be careful when we read these words. The Greek tells it like it is, all right? And I believe the verse says that we, okay, are going to stand before him without shame when he appears. That's what I believe. You don't have to believe that, but that's what I believe. We're not there because we deserve it. We're not there because we earned it. We're there because we're his children and his children only. The, he is coming back. He's not gone away, and take note of that. He is coming back, for all you out there who say he's not. He's coming back. He's not gone away and left us to our own devices, like, you know, he went away on some long vacation, and he's left us to the natural laws of, this, of the system. So let's imagine. Let's, let's imagine here. There we are at his appearing, where we imagine him saying something like, well, okay, did you believe in me when I said I loved you? Did you believe me when I said that I'd be with you, even in, until the end of the age? Did you believe me when I said I'd never leave you nor forsake you? Did you believe me when I said I love you with an everlasting love? And did you believe me when I said I was coming back? But because you didn't, I'm going to make you, thats it's a passive voice, I'm going to make you ashamed. Now, and folks, I don't think that is what the verse is saying at all. Now, if if you have a different opinion, I'm not I'm not gonna I'm I'm not gonna have any problem with that. But that is not what I believe it's saying. I don't believe that this shame is directed toward us at all. But those who did not remain continue abide in Him, who went out from us because they did not originate from us, as was the case with us. That, that, that they were not righteous as our Lord is righteous. Verse 29. Okay, hello. You're going to tell me that his children will be ashamed before him at his coming when it is shown that we have a character different, I, you know, from what we profess to have when, when our, our pretensions to goodness are stripped off and the heart's made bare, you know, that, that we, we Christians, will be ashamed in the last day when it's one of the promises made to us that we shall never be ashamed or confounded, okay? Which actually takes us into chapter 3, verse 1. You know, behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. That's, that's the very first verse of chapter 3. No matter what you think or believe, no matter what your personal convictions are, no matter what you lack in the way of faith, you think you muster faith up on your own, I got news for you, it's a gift, all right? Keep in mind that whatsoever is not of faith is sin, and yet faith is a gift from God. Uh, Christians just love to put the shoulder of the responsibility for all of this. And, and folks, but, but no matter how much you stumble or, or fall, from a moral standpoint, if you are one of God's children, you will not be made to, to be ashamed before him at his coming. I don't believe, all right? We're not looking at, at some passage that leaves us every day of our lives here fretting over the possibility that we might stand before our Lord Jesus Christ someday in shame when he appears. I do not believe that at all, 
Okay? What a life that would be. Think about it. Context, dearly beloved. I, I, I've, I've preached on the importance of that for as long as I can remember. So let's quickly review what we've seen to be true. What we've seen so far in the first two chapters. Okay, because we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 39. Verse 29, and this is the promise that he has promised us eternal life. Ye shall remain in him, verse 27, and because we remain in him, okay, when he shall appear, we'll have confidence, okay, and not be ashamed before him at his coming, as opposed to those who are not of him, who continue to deny him, we're in the context of the spirit of the Antichrist. And, you, and we see that same denial in Hebrews chapter 10, where God is writing to the early Hebrew converts, you know, there's not going to be another Messiah come. Now, that's the position that I'm forced to take on this verse. And here are a few reasons why. I want to give you a few reasons that... Uh, the Holy Spirit wants us to know things that are true of us from the beginning. That is our beginning. He uses that phrase often, if you've noticed the first two chapters here. From the beginning. Okay? I, I believe the Holy Spirit's trying to settle us in the fact of what's true of us. And then he places that in contrast to those, to that which is not true of those who are not his. So we're going to go on. We're going to quickly look at, 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 at what we've seen so far. We've seen that He, Christ, was the true light, that we're children of light, not darkness. We walk in the light, not darkness. Our sins have been forgiven for His name's sake. We hear and we guard His word. We know He loves us. We love one another. Our fellowship is in Him. We've overcome the wicked one. I mean, it, it's, it's amazing. It, it really is. It's it's. We, we, we continue, we remain in Him as opposed to those who don't, those who leave, uh, apostasy, okay, who went out from among us. We are not blind, rather we know where we're going. We're not, we're not to love the world which lies in darkness. We function out of the new man, not the old, therefore we will continue in Him forever. Only the new creation abides forever as opposed to those who went out from us and deny that Jesus is a Christ who don't have an, a new nature. The Holy Spirit will always remain in us, teaching us all truth. We are not of them who drew back unto perdition, but of them that believed in the saving of the soul. And this is the promise He's promised us, eternal life. Okay? Ye shall abide in Him. Verse 27. Highlight that. Okay? You will remain in Him. If you belong to Him, you'll remain in Him. Okay? And because we abide or remain in Him, when He appears, we'll have confidence. And that's an interesting word, that boldness, confidence. The word literally means, look it up, you Greek students out there, look it up. The word literally means freedom of speech. That's what it means. Freedom of speech. You hear a lot about that today. You turn on the news, you hear a lot about that. A bold, confident freedom of speech. That's what it means. That's in contrast now to, to, to being ashamed. I want you to take note of that. Okay? All right. And that boldness, that confidence, it's translated several ways, but that's the, the actual word in the Greek text is freedom of speech. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to later on, if you bear with me here, hang with me here on this, I'll, I'll show you a few verses. There's more than one that, that show that the wicked, their mouths are stopped. Titus 1.1 1, 1, They must be silenced because they are disrupting whole households by teaching things they ought to teach and that for the sake of dishonest gain. 
Psalm 63, 11. But the king will rejoice in God. All who swear by God will glory in him, while the mouths of liars will be silenced. Romans 3.19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who run to the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Psalms 107.42. The upright see and rejoice, but all the wicked shut their mouths. Proverbs 10.31. From the mouth of the righteous comes the fruit of wisdom, but a perverse tongue will be silenced. So there does seem to be some, uh, at least more than one reference in Scripture that, that tends to confirm the fact that it is the wicked whose mouths is stopped, that they don't have that confidence, that boldness, and therefore they are the ones that are ashamed before him at his coming. So I believe those who are being ashamed, that are ashamed here are not his at all. That's what I'm going to suggest. And, and I'm going to tell you again, this is not an easy pass. You've got to spend some time here thinking, studying, praying, comparing Scripture with Scripture. You need to spend some time on this, folks, because this is a really heavy passage of Scripture. But realize this, that, that in the last days, difficult times will come for men will be holding to a form of godliness Although they've denied its power, avoid such men as these. Okay? And I, and I want you to, to take note of the fact what this does not say. It doesn't say that, that he's the one ashamed of us. It doesn't say that. Okay? That's first of all. That ashamed is the result of not abiding in him. If you, if you really look at the verse, there's a reason why that we're, those are ashamed. And it is because... They didn't remain in Him, yet it's said of us that we will remain in Him. Are you getting that? Okay. If you didn't play that back, I probably couldn't say that again. All who are His will remain in Him. Therefore, my, as far as logic in deducing this goes, I, it's, it seems to me that no Christian could be or will be ashamed before Him at His appearing. Okay? Now, the new man, the sinless new man, which we're getting ready to, to really look at here in the next chapter. The new man in us, the righteous new man, because we've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. You have a sinless new nature. And I'm going to suggest that new nature could never, could never be ashamed. And I don't think that that's a stretch. I think it's safe to say the new, new man can't sin. So the new man can't be ashamed. So who's going to be ashamed? The old man at, at his appearing? Are you, are you with me on this? All right. I think that this is supported, what I'm saying, by context, because the context is, are those who don't remain, okay? The, the sinless new nature could never be ashamed. The, the sin nature, the, the flesh, is nowhere in the picture here. It's nowhere at his appearing. God doesn't even expect anything good to come from the flesh. The flesh profits nothing. And then we have the confidence of Paul to look at. Paul had confidence. We're going to look at that. According to my earnest expectation and my hope, that's, that's, that's a sure thing. That's not a hope like, well, I hope I win the lottery. A hope. Hope being guaranteed expectation that in nothing I shall be ashamed. Hello, okay, nothing I shall be ashamed. That was the confidence that he had. But that with all boldness, you, there's that word, confidence. As always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, body whether it be by life or by death. That's Philippians 1.20. And if you look at the, the 25th verse, and having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith. Ties right into what we're looking at here. Okay, that word ashamed, okay, is, it's from uh, iskos in, in the Greek. I hope I pronounced that right. Shame, disgrace. It's the same word used, okay, in 1 John 2, 29, okay, the word ashamed, where Paul says that, that he will not, okay, be ashamed. 
that in nothing I shall be ashamed. Same word. Same word. And now and we also have John 17, his prayer. This came to me last night. I went and read the whole chapter again. Our, the high priestly prayer of our Lord, as they call it, in John 17, uh, which was basic, is basically a prayer of unity, which I believe is answered. He didn't pray anything that wasn't answered. And then we have, I believe that supports this idea uh, that we, they won't, we won't be ashamed. And then, and you don't have to agree with me on this, but there's the nature of the judgment seat of Christ, Bema, which I believe con would contradict th that whole idea of our being ashamed. Our being ashamed seems to contradict Bema. Uh, uh, and then shall every man's praise come to him from God. Okay, so he, he appears, we're going to be ashamed, and then we go from being ashamed to every man's praise will come to him from God. I have problems with that. So we go from ashamed to praise at his appearance. Verses uh, 23 and 24. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father, but he that acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Let that therefore abide in you which you've heard from the beginning. If that which you have heard from the beginning shall remain in you. In other words, if you're a believer, you will remain. Okay? Ye shall also continue in the Son and in the Father. It's, so any possibility of our being ashamed would result in a life of constant fear of being ashamed. That any possibility of our being ashamed would, would result in, in the idea of human merit being involved, folks. We're not under law, but grace. Any possibility of our being ashamed would suggest that his work was insufficient. Any possibility of our being ashamed doesn't pair up with him being our advocate in relation uh, to Satan's daily accusations, in my opinion. Uh, I guess you could you could cry out, well, Steve, what about Revelation 21, 4? He shall wipe away every tear. So we're crying for some reason. It must be because we were ashamed. That is after the millennium. Okay? He dry, he wipes away every tear after the millennium. I'm going to venture, step out and go out on a limb and say that we're going to be well taken care of long before that. That isn't speaking of us. That he shall wipe. Now, may come as a shock to some of you, but that's, that's the context. Revelation 21. He shall wipe away every tear. When? After the millennium. After the thousand years. Okay? That isn't speaking of us. That, that confidence, that it, the definition in the Greek, it is a bold and confident freedom of speech. That means that those who are ashamed, their mouth is stopped. Okay? Cats got their tongue. Okay? And I think there's support for that. I think there's a lot of support for that, in fact. There's more than one, just a few verses that talk about the wicked their mouths being stopped. Okay? We have, in 2 Corinthians 4, 2, Paul says, we have renounced, that is, gave up, disowned the hidden things of dishonest honesty. The word dishonesty there is shame. Same word, same word. We've renounced the hidden things of shame. We have renounced it. We disowned it. Okay? Is what Paul's saying in 2 Corinthians 4, 2. Same word. Okay. Renounce the hidden things. Of dishonesty is maybe what your translation says, but it's the same word. Not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully. Okay, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. If our gospel, folks, is hid, okay, it's hid. It's hid to them that are lost. In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not. Okay? 
lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. And, and I want you to note uh, there, uh, for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness. Okay? That's, that's Genesis chapter 1. The one, and we know who that one is, okay, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, okay, has shined, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's, he did that. If you go to, I, I believe it's Hebrews, the first verse of Hebrews I believe chapter 12, we're to lay aside the sin which does so easily beset us. And, and many Christians think, okay, I've got to find that one sin that I can't stop doing and stop doing it. And that's what that means. It's not what that's saying. Lay aside the sin nature, the sin, singular in the Greek, the sin nature which doth so easily beset us, the old man, and boy does it. That's what we're to lay aside. Okay, that the old nature, folks, is the only one which could feel shame, and the old nature is not even going to be present at, at his appearing. Okay, we're not going to, to, when he appears, we're not going to stand there as we are now with two natures, an old man and a new man, like the old man's going to be there, and, and he's going to be ashamed of the old man. Of course, the, he can't be ashamed of the new man. Uh, look, see. Th can you see the problems that we have with this? Okay. Uh, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Okay. Now, that, that would suggest that, that uh, Jesus is the author of our shame. If you really went, if you really wanted to go down that, that path, that's basically what you're saying. But if you want to say that, that any believer would ever stand before him at his appearing in shame. Now, it's my position that I don't believe any of us will. I don't care. I don't care about the fact that in the immediate context, he's talking to little children, okay? That is not the point. I believe that, that even though he starts out little children, okay, here, it's, uh, which I, I, you can't argue that he's speaking to us. But that, that does not mean that it is, that is it is, his the God's little children, all believers. Little children is an expression used for all believers. That that is not does not imply in any way, in my opinion, that just because he's speaking to us, that that we may have confidence and and not uh, feel ashamed of him at his coming. That 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 is he's talking about. But some believers will feel shame at his appearing, and some will not, or maybe uh, I don't know. All of us will or maybe a few of us will, uh, boy, us good ones, us good Christians, we're not going to feel ashamed, but, but these, these ones over here that are not so good, you know, they're going to feel shame. And Folks, I, I'm sorry, I just can't go down that path. I hope I've given you something to think about here. I love you all, I truly do. Please continue to pray for my health issues, for the direction of this ministry, as I continue to pray for you daily that the Lord may open your eyes to understand the wondrous truth of His grace and how that, that, that grace applies to your life today. We're living in strange times. Uh, I think uh, many of us would, would agree that we, we never would have even imagined that we had, would have come to where we're at in our lifetime, much less since 2017. Folks, our Lord is coming soon. I do not believe that we, we in any way have to live our lives, walk through this life every day in our relationship with the Lord and have that possibility of being ashamed hovering over our heads like some dark cloud. I just, I don't believe that. I believe that the context is strictly contrasting those who are His with those who are not, and we're getting ready to go into 
the third chapter of the next video. Until next time, this is Steve. Thank you. I love you all. I truly do. Thank you for watching.